It's Friday, December 16th, 2022. I'm Jackson Bird. Today, an AI chatbot that can negotiate with customer service chatbots to lower your bills, cancel your subscriptions, and more. Plus, the reason why chocolate sometimes gets that white sort of chalky sheen on it. And a segment from the archives about the science behind some reindeer's color-changing eyes, real red-nosed reindeer, and the origins of that famous song. Here's some cool stuff for your ride home. Live text chatting with customer service is already better than having to call customer service and navigate through a bunch of menus and wait on hold forever. But what if you didn't even have to put up with the live chat? What if a bot could do it for you? That dream will soon be a reality thanks to Do Not Pay. Do Not Pay bills itself as a robot lawyer. And it's been around for several years, using AI to generate templates that people can use to help file complaints, cancel accounts, and in its original offering, fight parking tickets. In recent years, it's been expanding to anti-facial recognition and making terms of service agreements comprehensible to us non-lawyers. But now it's released its first ever AI chatbot that can interact with customer service representatives in real time. The company, via founder and CEO Joshua Browder, posted a video on Twitter of their bot's conversation with a Comcast chatbot in which their bot successfully talked Comcast's bot, and later a real human, into knocking 10 bucks off their monthly internet bill. Quoting Gizmodo, The video shows the bot launching a real-time text chat with the ISP's own Xfinity Assistant bot. Eventually, the Do Not Pay app gets connected with a live human agent. From there, the bot sends a long message complaining about multiple recent internet outages and the related workday disruptions they caused. The bot mentions multiple prior consumer lawsuits lodged against Comcast and said it would like to negotiate a new lower price for the same internet service. Failure to reduce that price, the bot says, could force it to take legal action against the company. End quote. Now, there were a few hiccups that Browder says they'll want to fix before the chatbot goes live. The bot exaggerated a bit on some of the facts about outages. It was kind of overly polite in an almost inhuman way. And at one point, instead of providing the user's correct email address, it said, insert email address. Fairly minor mistakes, especially for not being live yet, and they will all be fixed before it goes live. Browder told The Verge, quote, We've trained this AI to be like a robot lawyer for consumers, and I imagine that the disputes that we can handle have now gone up significantly because we can handle cases where you can respond rather than just sending one template, end quote. Now, as for how it works, quoting The Verge, Do Not Pay's bot is built on top of OpenAI's GPT-3 API, the underlying toolset used by OpenAI's ChatGPT chatbot that tons of people have been playing around with to generate detailed and sometimes nonsensical responses. Do Not Pay's tool is made for a specific purpose, though, and Browder seems to view it as an opportunity to expand the number of tasks it can tackle, like chatting with a representative to cancel a customer's subscription or negotiating a credit report. The tool will be open for testing in the next two weeks, and Browder says it will work with all companies in the U.S., end quote. Intriguing, to be sure. One Twitter user kind of summed it up in a response, quote, the future is just customer service chatbots and lawyer chatbots talking to each other, end quote. Which, I mean, you know, if the chatbots are just off on their own taking care of business so we can do other things, I guess that's all right. This time of year, it's pretty common to somehow accumulate too many treats. Leftover cookies from the company party, a box of chocolates you got as a gift, leftover candies your kid brought home from school. Some of it gets eaten, and some of it stays on the counter or in the cabinet for weeks on end, surviving into the new year and beyond until suddenly Valentine's Day chocolate is appearing in your house along the now slightly dry and chalky white chocolates from December. But what is that sort of white sheen that chocolate adopts over time? And is it safe to eat? That discoloration is called blooming. And while it usually takes up to four weeks for chocolate to bloom, it can occur more quickly due to poor storage, the main culprit of blooming. There are two types of chocolate bloom, 
Sugar Bloom and Fat Bloom. Sugar Bloom is usually that dry, kind of spotted coating and may make it taste a little grainy when you bite into it. Fat Bloom doesn't have the grainy problem, but is usually streakier and greasier in its appearance. Quoting How Stuff Works, when chocolate's exposed to too much moisture, sugar bloom can happen. That's because sugar is a hygroscopic substance. In other words, its crystals suck up moisture and retain it. If sugar gets wet enough, it might even dissolve a bit in the surface water. When the chocolate dries, the larger sugar crystals are left behind on the surface as a white powder. Sugar bloom is typically a storage issue. If you keep chocolate in a damp room, condensation can form on its surface." End quote. It can also happen if you store the chocolate in a relatively cool temperature and then quickly move it into a warmer environment. I've noticed this when I put some chocolate in the fridge during hot summer days so it doesn't melt, but then I'll take it back out because my house finally cooled down, and a day later it's become coated in that white filter. Now I know better. Sugar bloom can also happen while the chocolate is being made, if it isn't properly refined or if it has a filling, which might have introduced too much liquid when the candy was forming. Fat Bloom, on the other hand, quote, If it's just warm enough, the cocoa butter in the chocolate will separate a bit and settle on the surface of the chocolate, forming greasy streaks. Fluctuating temperatures can also be to blame. End quote. Now, while improper storage at home or on the store shelf can cause fat bloom, especially if it melts and re-solidifies, another thing I've fallen prey to far too many times, this version of bloom is more common during the production process, particularly during tempering. Quoting again, a process of repeatedly raising and lowering the chocolate's temperature to create uniform, stable crystals of cocoa butter. If tempering isn't done just right, the differently sized crystals can transform over time and voila, you've got bloom. End quote. Because it is so common during the manufacturing process, larger chocolate companies have different methods to suppress it. Some reduce the cocoa butter levels, and others add bloom inhibitors, like vegetable fats or oils, which don't usually impact the taste or texture. You can also see fat bloom if the chocolate was packaged before properly cooling, if there's another fat put in the chocolate that melts at a different temperature than the cocoa butter, or again, if the chocolate has some kind of filling. Chocolate is apparently very temperamental, which makes sense. As senior lecturer in chemistry at the University of Tasmania, Nathan Keela, put it, chocolate is made with cacao beans that are fermented and roasted to trigger chemical reactions that develop delicious flavors. But those chemical reactions are precise and can just as easily trigger not so delicious or aesthetically appealing outcomes like bloom. Keela offers these recommendations if you want to avoid bloom on your chocolate. Pick a brand with high cocoa butter content, transport and store your chocolate in low temperature, low humidity environments, and eat it before its best buy date. Though, as I said recently on the matter of best buy dates, it's best buy, not unsafe for you buy. It's perfectly safe to eat sugar bloom and fat bloom on chocolate, it just might not quite taste as delicious. Well, as I mentioned yesterday, we will be continuing with a dive into the Cool Stuff Ride Home archives today. Those last two segments were all new, but this one originally aired on December 10th, 2021, and it's about some intriguing studies into reindeer biology, plus an addendum about the origins of the song Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. North of the Arctic Circle in Norway, over the summer, the sun never completely sets, and in the winter, the sun never completely rises. And for one species in particular, this polar extreme creates a very unique characteristic. Arctic reindeer, it turns out, have golden yellow eyes in the summer and deep blue eyes in the winter. Like the same individual reindeer's eyes will change color with the seasons. At the behest of colleagues from Norway, neuroscientist Glenn Jeffrey has been leading research on this strange phenomenon since the early 2000s. Quoting National Geographic, 
The bit that actually changes color is the tapetum lucidum, or cat's eye, a mirrored layer that sits behind the retina. It helps animals to see in dim conditions by reflecting any light that passes through the retina back onto it, allowing its light-detecting cells a second chance to intercept the stray photons. The tapetum is the reason why mammal eyes often glow yellow if you photograph them at night. You're seeing the camera's flash reflecting back at you. Most mammals have a golden tapetum. And so do the reindeer in the summer, end quote. But the reason reindeer's eyes turn blue in the winter is because spending months in the near total darkness of the Arctic winters causes their eyes to be constantly dilated, and that dilation causes pressure that swells up the eyeballs. Quoting again, these events also changed the tapetum. This layer is mostly made up of collagen, a protein whose long fibers are arranged in orderly rows. As the pressure inside the eye builds up, the fluid between the collagen fibers gets squeezed out, and they become more tightly packed. The spacing of these fibers affects the type of light they reflect. With the usual gaps between them, they reflect yellow wavelengths. When squeezed together, they reflect blue wavelengths. End quote. Jeffrey and his team also think this makes the reindeer's eyes more sensitive, which adds up with what every optometrist has ever told me about my blue eyes, that light-colored eyes are more sensitive, so I need to be more careful about wearing sunglasses, etc. Reindeer's blue winter eyes, though, are apparently 1,000 times more sensitive to light than their golden summer eyes. So, like, dang, maybe they need to pull a Cory Hart and start wearing their sunglasses at night. The scientists disagree if the color change of the reindeer's eyes is actually what's causing the increase in sensitivity, though, so the research is ongoing. And as they've been trying to work it out, Jeffrey's team was hit by another curveball. They found reindeers who had been exposed to a bit of faraway streetlights in the winter, leading to only partially dilated eyes, and their tapetums therefore became not blue, but green. Quote, their pupils partly dilated during the winter, the pressure in their eyes increased a little, their collagen fibers became slightly squeezed together, and their tapetums stopped halfway along their yellow to blue transformation, et voila, green tapetum. End quote. And if all of this talk of color-changing reindeer is reminding you of a certain flying outcast, here's another weird fact. Some real-life reindeers do actually have red noses. They don't light up like a light bulb, but rather appear as some slight coloration around their snouts. A study published in the medical journal BMJ in 2012 explained that the redness occurred due to extremely densely packed blood vessels in the nose that supply blood and regulate the reindeer's body temperature in the harsh winter environment. As one part of the study, the researchers put reindeers on treadmills, and quoting Smithsonian Magazine, used infrared imaging to measure what parts of their bodies shed the most heat after exercise. The nose, along with the hind legs, reached temperatures as high as 75 degrees Fahrenheit, relatively hot for a reindeer, indicating that one of the main functions of all this blood flow is to help regulate temperature, bringing large volumes of blood close to the surface when the animals are overheated so its heat can radiate out into the air. End quote. So not only was Rudolph able to guide the sleigh, he was also probably maintaining a more steady body temperature while he did so. So take that, all of you other reindeer. Next time you might want to let him join in your reindeer games. And by the way, did you know that the Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer song, sometimes claimed to be the second best-selling Christmas record of all time, just behind Irving Berlin's White Christmas, and Rudolph as a concept himself is not nearly so old as we often think. The song was adapted from a poem that was written as promotional material for a department store in 1939. Yeah, so not some long-standing folklore or anything, just a guy named Robert May who came up with the story in 1939 as just another task for Montgomery Ward. They sent the poem out with illustrations by Denver Gillen as a free booklet for Christmas that year. But it became so popular that seven years later, they sent out twice as many copies. And then they actually gave the rights to its creator, Robert May, who published the story outright. And then his brother-in-law, Johnny Marks, wrote a song based on it, the same song we're so familiar with now. Even though they couldn't get their first choice of Bing Crosby to perform it, the version they did get with Gene Autry sold two million copies in its first run in 1949. 
Oh, and Johnny Marks, by the way, after adapting Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, also went on to write Rockin' Around the Christmas Tree, Silver and Gold, Run Rudolph Run, A Holly Jolly Christmas, and all of the music for the 1964 Rankin-based claymation adaptation of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. I don't know if May realized just how prophetic he would be in 1939 when he wrote the final lines of the song saying that Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer would go down in history. That little promotional booklet for Montgomery Ward certainly changed the trajectory of his life and of Johnny Marx's, and really a big chunk of modern-day Christmas in America. Well, that is going to be it from me for this week. I will be back with all new episodes on Monday, although a heads up that I will be taking a few days off around some of the upcoming holidays. More on that exact schedule next week. But for sure, I will be back on Monday with fresh and cool stories for you. And as always, this show was produced by Ride Home Media. I'm Jackson Bird, and I will talk to you again on Monday.